We're down here at Cherrybrook Technology High School with Australia's favourite math teacher, Eddie Wu. In the current coronavirus crisis, teachers across the country have been looking towards online learning, which is something that Eddie has been excelling at for years. I'm proud to declare I love mathematics. I used to believe that maths was about rote learning inscrutable formulas to solve abstract problems that didn't mean anything to me. There's a mathematical reality woven into the fabric of the universe. Just because mathematics doesn't come naturally, that doesn't mean you can't work with it and uh, come to an understanding of it. Eddie Wu, welcome to One Plus One. Kurt, thanks for having me. Mate, why should I fall in love with math? Mathematics is one of the most incredibly creative things that humanity has ever come up with. It didn't start that way. It started with people making sure they had settled accounts properly, that they were selling the right number of cows for horses. But from very practical beginnings, it really is truly a creative pursuit that, number one, allows us to understand the world around us. And I think that's something we all want. Um, people want to be you know, able to look at these perplexing things around us, like why snowflakes, if you've ever seen a picture of one under a microscope, have this beautiful symmetry and geometry to them, despite the fact that they kind of just randomly form in the air when it's cold and wet. What's going on there? What's the, what's the bottom of that mystery? And the answer is mathematics answers that. Not only does it help us understand the world though, it lets us achieve great things. It lets us, uh, you know, manipulate the world around us. It sends human beings to the moon and beyond. That's the power that mathematics has. So I feel it's worthy of your love, Kurt. <laughs> I, I feel like when I went through school, I remember doing maths and then uh, my teacher telling me, you need to know this because you're not going to be carrying around a calculator 24 <laughs> seven. It is fast forward 20 years. Every student is literally carrying around a calculator and more in their pocket, <laughs> in mo uh, like a mobile device. Mm. Why is math still important? Why do we still need to teach that to our kids? There's a few different ways to answer that question. It is quite funny that truly we have access to more calculating power than we ever could. And that might make people think, well, therefore, I don't, I don't really need to know how to add, subtract, division, trigonometry, calculus, don't I need to, I can just let technology take care of that. And I would argue a big reason why no. In fact, that technology is more of a reason to understand what mathematics is. I'll give you an example. That piece of technology inside our pockets, it lets us access a big wide world out there. You know, um, people probably never really understood how much of a difference the internet would make on society. But the internet is something that is run by algorithms, it's run by mathematics. When we jump onto, say, social media, which is not just for entertainment, that's something which changes uh, politics and elections and all kinds of really fundamental things about our world, what we see and what we don't see is governed by formulas hidden from view. And so in many ways, there's even more reason now that that technology is around to say, hold on a second, there's mathematics underneath here that I think I need to make sure I understand. And I could go on for more reasons. You know, when I'm at the shops, sure, I have that technology there, but that's for doing a simple calculation. What about when I'm listening to a, a news report and someone throws up a, a statistic or a chart? We've seen a lot of those in recent times. They inform our decision making. Should we come out of, um, you know, lockdown now or later? Are we, are we doing well battling this virus or are we actually struggling? Mathematics is what answers all those questions. You, you mentioned how uh, technology and the internet has changed the way we live. It's also played such a big role in your career. Can you tell me, can you tell me a little bit about WooTube? WooTube is what happens when someone appreciates dad jokes, names a YouTube channel. <laughs> I, uh, I started taking classroom <laughs> videos of what I'd filmed, a normal lesson that I would deliver in the classroom. Um, I started taking them and putting them online about seven years ago now. Um, and it was really not with a kind of global stage in view. It was just um, one student of mine who was very ill and, and couldn't make it to school. And I wanted to provide him part of the experience that his peers 
were having. Um, I remember when I was at school, not because I was sick, but because my mother was very sick, that uh, there were times when I had to miss a fair bit of school, and particularly in a subject like mathematics, and I don't know if you can relate to this experience, you might miss a day or, or a single lesson or even 10 minutes of a lesson, and then you look back up at the whiteboard and you just think, what does any of this mean? I feel like I'm missing some crucial pieces here and I'm just completely out to sea. And in mathematics, because so many of the pieces of knowledge and skill fit together, I knew that this boy who was gonna miss more than just a few pieces of knowledge, um, he was gonna miss weeks of school at a time, would not be able to recover from that. So I took my recordings of class, put them online so that he could access them. And it was quite a surprise to me that so many other people would find that valuable. And here we are, almost a million subscribers later, it's just kind of mind boggling. So what's the height of my square? There's an A here, and it's B. so you just add them together. What are some of the responses? Yeah, I'm sure that there are, your audience is worldwide. There are mathematicians out there that are tuning in. What are, <laughs> what are some of the responses that you're getting? Uh, you absolutely get the whole range of different responses. And uh, to start with, you know, I'm a high school teacher. So I think about children who are aged 12, roughly to 18. And that's kind of my target audience. That's who's in the classroom with me. But it's quite surprising to me that actually they only make up a small slice of who's watching. There's people um, younger who are looking for further learning. They're just curious and they kind of think, calculus. No one's told me that I'm not allowed to learn that yet. So I'm just going to go look it up. Um, there's people beyond that who've left school. And I think many people share this experience of going through mathematics in, in their formal education, never really clicking with it, but still being curious and wanting to know what was that all about? What did all those X's and Y's mean? So um, quite frequently, in fact, one of the most common comments that I get on videos was, ha, huh, this finally makes sense of Pythagoras' theorem or this other formula that I learned, which to me is delightful that it's something which can make sense of something which is in their brain, but they're never quite comprehended. There's a lot of maths uh, out there online. YouTube, there's plenty of videos. Why are there 63 million views on YouTube? You know what, Kurt? In all honesty, I wish I knew the full answer to that question because I think to myself, as you said, there's not just lots of maths videos, there's lots of all kinds of things on a platform like YouTube, immensely entertaining things, things which are crafted and designed to grab your attention and hold it. And I'm honestly um, quite perplexed. Why would you, of all the things you could spend your time on, <laughs> go and watch some maths voluntarily? I'm not forcing anyone. I think probably one of the things that's more unusual about what I do is that my students are there in the classroom when I'm recording. It really is just a normal lesson like I'm delivering every single day. And even though I've had some teachers say to me, that sounds crazy. Why would you put a camera and record your own mistakes when you make them? And you know, your, your students are chattering away in the side and you have to say, hey, you know, focus on this. Um, isn't that you know, something you, you feel vulnerable doing? But I actually think their interaction and, and the fact that when I speak to you, for example, right now, I'm speaking in a whole different way than I would if I was speaking to a camera lens and no one speaks to a human being the way they would speak to um, a disembodied empty room. So I actually think it's part of that human dynamic that helps me to teach better. And I wonder if that's the thing that's become helpful to people out there. I'm a, I'm a PDHPE teacher. I, I have to teach children hurdles. Uh, I don't have a lot of expertise in hurdles, but <laughs> what's more important to you expertise or passion? Wow. When it comes to selecting between expertise and passion, in some ways I feel like that's asking which wing of the plane would you like to keep? <laughs> because they really are these, these complementary pieces that, I mean, when we think of all of the teachers who made a difference on us, I think about the, the teachers I had, particularly in high school, who I remember now, and, and some of whom I remember, I remember them more than I remember any individual lesson that they gave me, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that experience. The expertise and the passion really had to be married together. It, I had several teachers who, who knew so much, but could not convey that in a personal and relational way, so I didn't learn much from them. But at the same time, just because you can develop great rapport with someone, if you don't have anything to help them to learn, if you have no expertise to share, then what is the value of that relationship? I think it's important to recognise as well, expertise takes many forms. 
Um, there's expertise in a mathematics classroom, but there's also expertise that, say, our student counsellors have, which is nothing to do with academics, but is, is very deep and complicated as well. So I'd really like to not have to choose between those. Uh, this time, we're in the middle of 2020. It's a turbulent year for teachers, students, uh, and parents. You're a dad of three kids. I've got two. I, um, I could teach 30 children, no problems. You know, like I, I'm, I'm down with that. But you get me to homeschool my six-year-old and I'm grabbing for the bottle at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone, Kurt. You're not alone. How did you deal with, uh, with the current situation? I, I'm, I can't lie, it was an immense challenge. Um, I relished it, it was fantastic, but it did absolutely help me learn that uh, when I think about the dynamic between a parent and a child, I could say, yeah, it's harder. Like you said, put me in front of a classroom, suddenly, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm like a, a, a duck to water. It's, everything is, is very natural in some ways, but you have a very different relationship with your children. We all do. Uh, we teach them very different things. At the end of 53 minutes at this high school, the bell goes and I can say bye and I don't have to worry about you making sure your meal is finished, uh, making sure you've got all the right clothes on and the right body parts, all these kinds of things that as a parent are a whole different story. So I feel like I definitely learned a lot more respect from my children's teachers, but I also recognise every parent out there who's been struggling through that don't be too hard on yourself. You're teaching your children, helping them learn through every experience you have with them, not just when you're remote learning. What advice would you give to those parents at home who are now taking that primary role as educator? If you're a parent who's at home struggling with trying help to make me. sure, yeah, help helping, me, Andy. helping your kid learn, <laughs> I totally get it. I mean, I think what's important is if there's mm -hmm. one lesson which I think every parent can take on, which I've really tried to give myself my own advice, is to be a co learner with your child. Um, I'm a mathematics teacher, but actually the way that even my own subject has been taught, even a subject as timeless as mathematics, um, it's different for my kids going through, you know, uh, 20 plus years after when I went through. And so I'm actually sitting beside them saying, okay, the most valuable thing I can give to you now is not knowledge that I can transmit to you. I'm not their teacher the way that their classroom teacher is, but I want to show them, hey, Let's struggle together. Let's learn something new together. Let's discover something and experience that joy through that struggle side by side. I think that's something that every parent can do. I feel like in the middle of the school day uh, while we were uh, homeschooling that the video from our teacher or my boy's teacher was a lifesaver. How does it feel that teachers around the country are now looking to WooTube and now looking to Eddie Woo to see how do we do this? I'm equal parts you know, delighted and terrified. <laughs> it's, it's a real weight of responsibility to know that people are looking at your practice and I've always had an open door policy in my classroom whenever my colleagues wanna see, how do you do this? I'm, yeah, absolutely, come on in. It's a bit of a different premise when suddenly it's a country or even now um, I've had colleagues from uh, the US who are trying to work out uh, school reopenings. You know, it's a, it's a different part of the school year for them, obviously, and they're now trying to work out how do we transition to this? You've got resources that can help us there. And I'm so glad I can be helpful to them, but I'd be lying if I didn't feel nervous at all. Um, it really makes sure that I, I'm sharp and I'm giving absolutely the best I can every time I'm in the classroom, even more than when I'm thinking about the kids in front of me. Well, how are the kids going? Do you think children are adapting to our current situation? It's such a mixed bag when I think about how children have responded to um, this, you know, cataclysmic change in the way that their, their whole world functions. What's been amazing to me is to see how resilient some of these kids are. It's astonishing when we think about, you know, the word unprecedented gets thrown around a lot in these times. But in some senses, these kids don't know much else. This is kind of, all right, there was just a couple of months in the year where I just had to take charge of my own learning and uh, make sure I was responsible for that and accountable to that. But at the same time, I think it certainly has the situation has revealed a lot of inequities across our system. I'm really fortunate to be in a school that is incredibly well resourced. You've got kids who have no trouble accessing uh, technology and internet and devices and all the rest, but it's definitely not consistent across New South Wales or indeed the country. And I think that's really shone a light that we need to address, that we can't let that be something which just goes back to normal. Inequality at the moment is, it seems to be showing up more than ever, uh, especially when it's access to, say, online equipment to be able to take classes into the 
home. What do we need to do to adjust to that? There's small changes and there's also really big structural changes that need to be made. When we think about small changes, um, some things are easy to solve. You know, I know there was, there was programs for providing technology and improving internet access uh, to different families and communities, and that's fantastic. We absolutely need to do that. But in fact, there are some much deeper problems that you can't solve by sending someone a laptop. As an example, uh, in mathematics, one of the most common uh, problems that we face is that we do not have enough qualified mathematics teachers especially in remote areas. And so many of the teachers who we are so grateful for and they're doing their best, but they're what we call out of field. So they are qualified in a subject other than mathematics. And we're saying to them, hey, look, we need someone to teach these year sevens and eights mathematics. Can you help out? You know, you're gonna have to be provided support to learn that, but you're gonna go in there. It's not your main expertise and you're gonna have to sort of learn as you go. Now, that is an enduring problem that when we think about why that is the case, it's because, you know, how do we actually make sure that these uh, communities are not just having a qualified teacher come in, but then just as quickly leave that community? I know I've worked with teachers who have gone out to work in places like Broken Hill, Deniloquin, and the first question that they get asked when they arrive in the school is, how long are you gonna be here for? because there's this assumption from the students, they know people, they come in and then they leave and that expertise doesn't have the opportunity to actually grow there and support those communities in a, in a longitudinal way. Why is there a worldwide shortage of mathematics teachers? When we think about what it takes to be a mathematics teacher, we talked before about expertise and passion and, and the importance of relationship with students. And when you think about the overlap of different skills that you need to be a great mathematics teacher, I think if you have all of those skills, there are a hundred other professions, careers, almost all of which are far more lucrative and gain much more respect in society and standing in society than being a mathematics teacher. Uh, in fact, I still remember with every good intent that several of my teachers when they heard that I wanted to go into education at university, they were the people who were the most strong in saying, don't do this, you could do so many other things. And I find that heartbreaking, but at the same time, they had nothing but the best of intents for me. I think they really thought you can do something where you can earn twice as much money, you can be much more comfortable, work not as hard and uh, have, have you know, a great, a great home to live in and, and especially in a place like Sydney. And so there's a lot of change in society that needs to happen about the way we view our educators uh, and the way that we, we attract them. What, what salaries and awards look like? They're all part of that uncomfortable but very important conversation we have around attracting people into this profession. Are we paying teachers enough? Kurt, I always feel it's a bit disingenuous for me to give an honest answer to that question because, Kurt, if I said to you, yes, we are paying them enough, you'd say, really? <laughs> and if I, if I said no, I would think people would say, of course he would say no. I have a bit of a vested interest in saying that, but I can definitely put this to you. When I think about my friends who would have made fantastic mathematics educators, when I think about um, the son of a taxi driver I met once who said to his dad, Dad, uh, I, I can't be, I can't be a math teacher. I know I'd be a really good one, but I could do, and he just listed off all of the different things that, the different career paths that he could access where he knew he'd be great at them as well, but could just earn double, triple, 10 times more. He said, Dad, I can't do that. He's responding to the incentives that society's given to him. Who could blame him for that? So in lieu of saying, no, Kurt, <laughs> I simply can only say, let's look at the situation that we've created for ourselves in society, where we do not have enough mathematics teachers. We have so few that by the end of year seven to 10, by the end of year 10, only about 13% of those students across the country have had a trained mathematics teacher every single year, 13%. 87% of all of us at least one year, likely more, we had to do our very best learning from someone who was also doing their very best to teach a subject that was not their area of expertise. What are, why are we surprised? Those students are then struggling and are missing some of those pieces and then say, I can't learn this. 
the main reason why people feel like people say to me every time I meet them, oh, you're a mathematics teacher. I could never do maths. Everyone can do maths, provided with the right support and guidance, but that support and guidance usually isn't there. This is a situation we've created for ourselves in society by the economic decisions we've made. I feel like that answers the question pretty comprehensively. The reason why I would become a teacher was because they, a teacher would sit down with me and say that the most powerful part of you is your desire. You, that will be the thing that will get you through life. That is the most important thing, more important than, a, than an exam mark. That is what you need to nurture. And it was the thing that I needed to hear at that point in time. Did you have a teacher that, that pointed you in the direction that you needed to go as a kid? Hmm. Wow. There are so many teachers of mine who I have this unrepayable debt to, who did exactly what you just mentioned in terms of uh, nudging me in a direction and saying, you know what, you have, you have an opportunity, um, you have gifts, many of which are not because of you. You were born in this country because, well, for me, my, my parents migrated here. I didn't choose that. Um, I, was, I was raised in an area with amazing schools that helped me to really uh, cultivate the skills that I had from, from home and that are part of my DNA. So many of those teachers uh, were sort of indirect in the way they did that. I think about, say, my agriculture teacher in Year 7, Mr Brown. Uh, he never had this moment where he said to me, you know, Edward, what you really need to do is, is X, you know, go in this direction. But he gave me this example of someone who cared for me as a human being before he cared for me as a student. I wasn't the most successful farmer there, but that was never an obstacle to Mr Brown always coming beside me, patiently saying, okay, well, you're trying to learn how to do this. Let me try and understand the piece that's missing and then get you to the point where you understand and you can answer a question or you can um, be able to make good decisions to help your things grow. And so Mr. Brown taught me human beings first, relationships first. And that's something which as a teacher now, every single day that I'm in a school, that's a lesson which has carried with me. I'm so delighted that I get to try and teach the next generation that same lesson. I hope I can. Are we talking enough about how, how we can get every teacher to buy into that conversation, to buy into the, the power of belief when you put it in a kid? That's a really hard question to answer because I have a lot of empathy for every teacher out there who knows that that is true, that the power of belief, that conviction can unlock a child's potential, which is an amazing thing to see. But at the same time, the reason why I have empathy with those teachers out there struggling to actually do that is because whilst we would love to do that every single day, there's always this increasing number of responsibilities aside from caring for a student and being able to um, give our classes exactly what they need, which often are distractions, um, which, you know, paperwork and, and processes and administration are important. They help us do our jobs better. But when, when they take us away from the core part of the work, which is our students and our ability to help them grow, um, that, that's really unfortunate. And many students uh, don't get that experience because their teachers are distracted by the burden of all these other things they have to do as educators. Do you think that community are valuing right now that, that contribution? Do you think that they're seeing the role of a teacher completely different because of the, the setting that we've found ourselves? I really hope that one of the silver linings out of this experience is that seeing our kids, uh, watching them struggle with learning face to face, rather than that being a, a distant and, and sort of experience that you're separated from because they do that during nine to three and then I, I see them after it's all over. I really hope that is helping our society appreciate that more. And I hope that that's a launch pad. You know, just to say, oh, I get it, that's really tough, is clearly not enough. We've got to make decisions. We've got to change policies and structures to enable the work that matters in schools to flourish. We have a lot of progress to make still. How was your experience as a, as a primary school student or in the education system itself? I had a really mixed experience going through school myself. I remembered being, uh, you know, a, a person who didn't fit in very well at primary school in particular, uh, growing up uh, as an Asian face that spoke only English. Uh, I really felt like I didn't belong anywhere. Uh, I didn't look like most of the people in my classroom. Uh, and those few occasions where I got to go back to where my family 
uh, had its ancestry, um, I, could, I could blend in if I didn't open my mouth. And as soon as I said something, it's kind of like, you foreigner, what are you doing here? <laughs> and so there really was this sense of kind of, oh, I, I was kind of never in a place where I, I knew who I belonged with. And, you know, I think in some ways, every child goes through some version of that, um, whether it was kind of like, oh, I wasn't sporty when I was growing up, or I was way taller than my friends, or who, wh whatever experience it was. And so primary school was difficult for me um, because of that. And I certainly didn't feel like I had a way to uh, find my own identity in that place and, and find the people who, who understood that identity. That really changed, I think, when I went to high school and um, for the first time really was surrounded by people who loved learning in the same way that I did, but also understood what it was like to be a little out at sea, that sort of uh, second generation migrant experience where I, f I feel down in my bones. I'm Australian. People ask me, where are you from? I say, I was born in Camperdown. Like, is that the answer <laughs> you were looking for? Um, but to be able to say, yes, that's part of my identity. And also where my parents and grandparents come from are also part of my personality and my values. Um, to be able to marry those together was something which I think finally clicked when I was in high school and, and then got to flourish as I went beyond that. I don't know a teacher that's got into the profession for um, recognition or riches, but you've received one of those moments that are just so unique. As, as, as local hero of the year, how do, you, how do you experience that moment being held up to the country for, for the deeds that you do? Look, it was absolutely, um, it, was, it, was, it was an out-of-body experience, to be frank with you. <laughs> um, and to, let's, just, let's just take a step back for a second, right? Like, the phrase Australian of the year is just such a, like, I've had to, I've been asked to introduce myself sometimes um, on, like, a, at a conference or um, at an interview, and it's kind of like, I'd say, oh, hi, hi, I'm, my name is Eddie Wu, I'm a high school mathematics teacher. And they'll, they'll sort of interrupt me and say, no, 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 can you say that thing about, you know, you're in Australia? And I say, <laughs> how can anyone with a straight face say, hi, I'm Eddie Wu, I'm one of the Australians of the year, it just seems bizarre. And I very much feel, you know, people talk about imposter syndrome, right? Uh, as if that's something we've got to kind of get over and, and sort of, um, you know, come to the point where you feel like, no, no, this is something you deserve, you're in the right spot. I've never been able to, with a serious face, say, yeah, sure, this is a, a mantle and a, like a title that I can say I justly deserve. I, I've never felt that way, and I still don't. Um, I, I literally meant, by the way, that it was an out-of-body experience. I remember when the Prime Minister read out my name, the, the, <laughs> the bottom half of my body, I just lost sensation. I, I kind of thought to myself, oh, no, I'm going to have to get up and walk. <laughs> How am I going to do this? I, I, I just... I thought this, this can't be real. Um, and I, I think about all of the, I, I knew that I was there not as an individual, but as a representative of what education means and what educators stand for. And, and that's the sense in which I can say, all right, I can, I can be here. I can receive this on behalf of uh, what education means to our society. I'm, I'm here to say all of education, every educator is valued, should be valued. That's why I'm holding this as a proud representative, just like I guess a, you know, a captain holds up the trophy at the end of a, of a game that they've been victorious of, not just to say uh, we won, but to say this victory belongs to all of us. Mate, I love what you do. I want, uh, I want, I want someone like you to be in the front of my kids' class. So thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Kurt, it's all my pleasure.